in a new light. The world looks completely different when we start to see time divided into smaller chunks. But just how far can we keep on dividing time? The smallest unit of time that has any sort of significance in the universe as we understand it is called the Planck time, which is 10 to the minus 43 seconds. That's a, a million, 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 millionth and a little bit more of a second. In the quantum world, the world of subatomic particles. The Planck time is the time it takes light to travel the shortest possible distance that our current theories can handle. Beyond this point, our understanding of any smaller times stops. To tell the time, we used to look up at the sun and stars. But the Earth doesn't keep good time. With the advent of atomic clocks, we can now track time with far greater accuracy. And by looking back in time, we can work out the moment when time itself began, at least in the universe we see around us. If we want to know what time is it, we're certainly making progress. But there's one last profound question I want to answer. It really encapsulates our experience of life. It cuts to the very heart of what it feels like to be human. It's how we define the timeline of our lives. Why does time seem to tick along in the way that it does? Have you ever wondered, why do I have to move into the future? Why am I not allowed to go back into the past? Why am I not allowed to stand still in time? And so if you want to understand why, you know, why existence feels like this, then you need to know what time is and why it passes in the way that it does. A hundred years ago, it was Albert Einstein who started tackling these profound questions. As part of his radical new theory of nature, he fundamentally altered the way we understand time. For Einstein, space and time uh, are not the separate things that we feel them to be. They're in many ways the same. And in fact, they're merged together into a, a single entity called space-time. Space-time can be pictured as a sort of fabric where time and space are inextricably woven together. As a result, the dimensions of space and time can get mixed up. The astonishing outcome is that we don't all experience the same time. For Einstein, time wasn't like a, a metronome that just ticks the same for everybody. It's different for you and me and everywhere in the universe, the metronomes tick at a different rate. Einstein said that two people will only ever agree on the speed time ticks if they're standing next to each other. If I was to fly past you incredibly fast, I would see your time tick much slower than mine. This idea lies at the heart of Einstein's theory of relativity. No one has a right to, the, to claim that their time is the time, the absolute time. It just depends on who's moving relative to who. When someone moves through space relative to me, because of this mixing of space and time, I will see their time tick slower the mine. But the strange nature of time doesn't stop there. It's not just how fast you're moving, but what you're next to that also affects time. 
According to Einstein, you should see the time tick slower at my feet than at the top of my head. This is because the nearer you are to a big object like the Earth, the more bent and warped is the space-time and the slower time ticks. On our planet, the effect is minuscule, but out there in the universe, the vast mass of the stars and galaxies bend and warp the space-time so much that time ticks all over the place. In the 1960s, Einstein's strange notion of time was put to the test using the large haystack radio antenna just north of Boston. An experiment was devised to see if the sun causes time to tick differently to how it ticks here on Earth. Astronomer Erwin Shapiro was at the helm. What we wanted to see was how long it would take a light signal to get from the Earth to Mercury and its echo to get back to the Earth. And that's what we were looking for, a measurement of time to very high accuracy. But even using one of the most powerful radio antennas in the world, this wasn't going to be easy. Any echo coming back from Mercury would be incredibly weak. The echo has very little power. I can describe it as the power put out by an ordinary housefly crawling up a wall at the rate of a millimeter per millennium. That's <laughs> per thousand years. That's how little comes back. By knowing the distance to Mercury and the speed that light travels, Erwin knew exactly how long it should take for a signal to go out and come back again. But applying Einstein's theory, the presence of the sun would have an effect on the result. We see something strange. It's like a, a spike appears in the orbit whenever the planet goes behind the sun as seen from the Earth. So it looks it's, almost like it's drifted a little bit further away as it goes right. by the back of the sun. It, it looks like it went, it, deviated from its orbit. Instead of going in a nice, smooth orbit, it had a spike in the orbit like Which, of that. course, it doesn't. It doesn't have. It's just a, a, a manifestation of the fact that light took longer to get to the planet and back when the light went near the sun. The apparent blip in Mercury's orbit is all down to the bending of time. The huge mass of the sun bends and curves the space-time, the fabric of the universe. As Erwin's radar beam passed by the sun, the warping of space-time meant that time for the radar pulse got stretched relative to time on Earth. Time was slowed down by the mass of the sun. This effect came to be known as the Shapiro time delay. There are very few physicists, actually, who have an effect or anything named after them. Well, it's sort of embarrassing, but on the other hand, I must say I take a secret pleasure in it, maybe not so secret. Erwin's measurement agreed perfectly with Einstein's prediction. We really do see time slow down near the biggest objects in the universe. Time just